So um, have you ever walked in the street and uh, Chabadnik stopped you and asked you, excuse me, are you Jewish? <laughs> and if you say yes, he will ask you to do a mitzvah and wrap tefillin. Or he'll give you a brochure. Um, especially in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue during Hanukkah, there'll be... Uh, Dozens of uh, mitzvah mobiles stopping you and asking you if you're Jewish and uh, if you want to do a mitzvah. So we're going to discuss today, is there any advantage in doing one mitzvah? So you stop in the street, you wrap tefillin with him, or he gives you a Hanukkah menorah, which you maybe put on the shelf in your house, and you might never use it again. Is there anything special about doing one mitzvah? And um, now, do you do it for yourself or you did it for Hashem? So today we're going to speak about our patriarch Avram Avinu. And we're going to learn some lessons from Avraham's life. So here we have a typical Chabadnik wrapping tefillin with someone in the middle of the street. Now... Abraham had an orchard. He had a little inn. You know, you're driving up the 95 or the turnpike and you're looking for a, for a hotel. That's exactly what Abraham had. It sounds very inviting. It's like a bed and breakfast. The, similar to bed and breakfast establishment. But in, in Avram's case, it was a lot more than bed and breakfast. Look at text number 1a, quoted from the Chumash from this week's Torah portion. It says, Vayita Eishel. Eishel has many different explanations. So the Medrash explains, as you see here in text number 1b, and explaining in 1c, that Eishel could either be he planted an orchard to give sweet fruit to many people, or he gave them a warm meal. So he either gave them sweet fruits, according to one opinion. According to another opinion, he gave them a hot meal. But in any case, it could be both. He gave them a hot meal, and he gave them sweet fruit. As we see here, that a shell is an abbreviation. Aleph stands for achila, which means to eat. The shin stands for shtia, which means to drink. And the lamet stands for levia. And by the way, it's very important if you ever have a guest over in your house, it's a very important custom to walk them to the door. This is we learned from Avram Avinu. It means to lead them out. You don't just sit at your table and say goodbye, but you actually walk them to the door so they feel comfortable. And that's a big mitzvah which we actually learn from Avraham. Now, it makes no difference if it was an orchard or an inn or both together, but the hospitality of Avram Avinu was nothing short of amazing. Let's look at the, the hospitality of Avram Avinu. The events happened as follows. Three days after Abraham was circumcised, and by the way, he wasn't eight days old. He was 99 years old. And he was circumcised three days prior to this. He was in a lot of pain. So God decided, I don't want any guests coming to Avram's house because he's been circumcised and he has a lot of pain. So I'm going to... Oh. So I'm going to uh, make it boiling hot outside. Now, if it's very hot outside, no one's going to come to visit Avraham Avinu. But Avraham was in more pain because he loved having guests over. So Hashem decided, I'm not going to make Avraham so much pain. I'm going to send him over some guests. So Avram's standing by the door and he sees three angels 
coming towards him. Now he didn't know there were angels. They were dressed like men. And Avram stood up, even though he was in terrible pain from his circumcision, but he was so excited to see the guests. And he got up and he went to the door to go greet them. Now, Avram offered them in his tent, he offered them water to wash their feet. And in a short amount of time, he prepared for them a hot meal. Now, if this is what he did when he was in terrible pain, could you imagine the, hospil the hospitality that he had and he offered when he was healthy? Like we said before, that he was a full service in. And by the way, it's written in many commentaries, his tent had four corners, four doors. So if people were walking from any direction, they would easily be able to enter. He had a back door, he had a front door, and he had a door on both sides. So people that walked in the desert would not have to make a roundabout or go around any other direction. They were able to have an easy entry. And this is that Avram was always available for the guests. So one guy could be walking in from one door and the next one from the next door, and he really treated them royally. Now, it was not only to eat and to sleep, but there was a much deeper agenda that Avram actually had over here. The agenda he had was pretty much as follows. Look at text number 3A. He wanted to get them to bless Hashem. He wanted them to thank Hashem and give Hashem praise. As we see here in text number 3a, he wanted them to call out the name of Hashem and we'll explain what happened. You know, the first motel or hotel was the Avram Avinu. It was also the first Chabad house. For any other matters, it was the first soup kitchen that was ever created. The first synagogue, the first yeshiva, whatever you want to call it. He was the first. Now, he knew the way to get a person's heart, a man's heart, is through food, through their stomach. So he fed them. Then... They wanted to bless Avram and say, thank you, Avram, for such a beautiful meal. He says, no, don't thank me. Thank God. Now they brought their idols with them. You know, they all came in with these little bags and they had these little idols. And their plan was when they finished the meal, they're going to take out the idol and thank their idol for the food that they just ate. Avram told them, put that back in your bag and you're supposed to praise God for he's the one that gave you the food. And sometimes Avram was unsuccessful. Some people refused to bless God. So Avram had a plan, plan B. The Medrash explains here in text number 3B, he tells them as follows, where are you gonna get wine from in a desert? Well, for 10 coins, you could get wine in a desert and you just drink several glasses of wine. Meat in a desert is also going to cost 10 coins. Bread in a desert is also going to cost 10 coins. Well, now you got to give me 30 coins. So the majority of them would say, okay, we'll, we'll thank God for our food. So they were sort of forced into thanking God for the food. Now, they didn't want to pay. So they said, I'd rather thank Hashem, you know. The other way around, if, God, if, if you go over to a Jew and you tell a Jew, if you don't bow to an idol, we're going to charge you a lot of money. The Jews don't care. You know, they'll pay all the money. No Jew wants to bow to an idol. But the other way around, they obviously didn't care. And Avram explained to them about the concept of God, of God. But this brings us to a very important question. Was Avram being honest? 
as we mentioned in the beginning? Is there value to make a blessing when you're forced to do it? They don't necessarily even mean it. They're just doing it to, av to avoid a fee. Of course, God liked what Abraham was doing because we see in several other sources that Hashem told Abraham, thanks for spreading my word all over the town. Thanks for letting everybody know that I'm God and I exist. So Avraham ultimately, Hashem appreciated it. But wait a minute. What's the point of forcing a guy to bless God and then he leaves? He's still carrying his idol with him. You think it had an effect on him? And besides the point, it seems to be that Avraham was a little dishonest. He didn't disclose to them in the beginning of the meal, wait a minute. Thank you for coming. It's going to cost you 30 coins. If you praise God, it will be free. He didn't disclose that to them in the to them in the beginning. So seems like Avram was sort of tricking them into it without being upfront. Well, let's look here at text number four A. Um we see something very specific here. When you look at the beginning of the text, we see Avram Avinu served people that came into the test, into his tent. He didn't do any initiative to get them in, meaning he didn't go outside, call people in. He sat by the door. If they wanted to come in, it was their choice, and he let them in. He didn't go outside calling people in, which basically explains by the commentary here in 4B that Avraham didn't lie to the guests that they're eating for free. Avraham arranged an inn, and he charged for the food but he was ready to give an incredible discount if you praise God. He didn't ever tell you it's free. <laughs> he never told you come in, eat and drink as much as you want. He never said that. He, he, they walked in on their own. When you come in and eat a meal under normal circumstances, it's going to cost you money. But Avram said, if you praise God, you, will, you won't have to pay at all. So, this pretty much covers the idea that there wasn't really a trick here. It was just a discount if you praised God. Not only he didn't mislead the guests, but it was completely fine. Avram believed that he cannot take money from them because my food came from God. But if they weren't ready to praise God, where Avram knew his food came from, he had a perfect reason to charge them. And if they changed their mind and they said God does exist, then Avram wouldn't take money. So in other words, Avram didn't mislead them. There was nothing misled, which by the way is a big sin in the Shulchan Aruch. It explains, you know, if you, if you sell an item and you make it look really nice and you hire the price and really it's not, you know, you give your car a car wash and you clean it up nicely and you say the car is in good condition and you lie to the customer, that's not allowed. And many things the Shulchan Aruch goes into where you mislead people. You're selling them an item or you're selling them a service and you're misleading them with the service that you are offering them. That's generally not allowed. And um, so this helps us understand how Avram did this. But the fact that they blessed Hashem in a way is maybe not sincere. So what's the point of forcing them to bless Hashem? 
And now we come to the main point of today's class. Avraham did not play a mind game on the people that came to visit. Avraham used a time-tested tool in order for people to be convinced to his opinion. And let me explain to you what this means. So basically, I'm going to explain here. Uh, yeah, so basically the idea is like this. By the way, everyone around besides Avraham believed in idols. They bought big idols, small idols. It was an all about idol worship. When they heard Avraham's argument, they would be convinced that Avraham is correct. Now, you have to understand that Avraham was a master teacher. He had a way with words. He had a lot of arguments and proof that Hashem exists. He was really very well to explain that there has to be a God. Where does the water come from? Where does the skies come from? The mountains, the trees. He had a way of explaining. He had 400 chapters that he wrote to explain and knock off and explain that all their idols are incorrect. And to every person, he explained in a different way. He had an argument for each individual. He had an objection to everyone individually. Avraham's response was beautiful. Avraham was a powerful influencer. He could have been a very good salesman. And he was. He was a great salesman. He was selling God to everybody. When he opened his mouth, everyone would listen. Some people were moved by his logic. Others by his passion. But everyone was moved. Avram did not shy away from any questions. He addressed every concern that everyone had. He explained to everyone that Hashem is present in the creation of the world. And he's also concealed inside the world. You can't see him. So if you don't see him, doesn't mean he doesn't exist. That's what he was trying to explain them. You don't have to see him. He explained to them how God pays attention to every single thing that's going on in the world. In your personal life, in your family life, in your children's life, in everything, God is paying attention to everything that's going on. He's protecting you. He's taking care of you. He's giving you everything you need. Definitely, Abraham had students that were deaf to his explanation. They were like, no, wait a minute, I don't buy that. <laughs> you know, there was always those couple people that disagreed. Well, obviously, I don't think the man in this picture is Avraham. It's supposed to look like Avraham, but I would say probably that Avraham had a long white beard. That's what I would imagine him. So, uh, but it's just an analogy of giving an idea of everybody listening to someone speaking. So, but there were people that did not listen to Avraham. Not everybody listened and not everybody was inspired, even though he spoke really well, even though he had a great approach. He couldn't get into them. You know, you talk to people and they're just deaf. They don't listen. But Rabbi, yes, if I may, a question. Sure. Those people that did listen to him, did they become Jews? Do we know? The people that did listen? Yeah. Well, Avram's goal was not to convert anyone to Judaism because mm -hmm. there was no Jews then. Avram was the only one that actually kept the Torah, but he couldn't even keep it 100%. He kept it like, you know, only certain things like Shabbos and kosher and things like that. And his goal was to get people to believe in God. That's his, that was his ultimate goal. And by the way, that's also our goal today for Gentiles, for people that are not Jewish. We don't have, to, we don't have a mission to convert non-Jews to Judaism, but we do have a mission 
to get even non-Jews to believe in one God. And that's what he was trying to accomplish. And that's it. So that was the ultimate goal. Now, did they change their mind later and stop believing in idols? Possibly many did. Yeah. Yes. Now, so Avram didn't give up when someone didn't have a complete understanding about what he was saying. He explained it to them with reasons and so on and so forth. He saw that they have a soul inside them that, with that, that has a hard shell on top of it. But once he broke inside that shell, he was able to have a strong influence on them. What did Avram want to do? He wanted to create. He wanted to sort of shock them. He wanted to force them to reevaluate their opinion. He had to give them an emotional reason to believe in God stronger than the emotional reason not to believe in God. The sudden possibility that the guy thought in his mind that he's going to be left penniless. So Avram says, wait a minute. Do you want to pay me 30 coins? You don't want to bless God, but then you have to pay me 30 coins. So when the guy realized that he's going to have to give all his money he has to Avraham, because you're in a desert, and you really can't really get anything in a desert, and it's very valuable. So all of a sudden, he gave it another thought. And even though he fought against the belief in God, but not strong enough to be left penniless. And after they did bless God and say, thank you, God, for the food, and thank you for the bread and the meat and the, and the wine, then he started explaining to them about Hashem. You know, it's like you knock on someone's door and they don't answer. And then you knock again and they finally answer. And once you're in and you have them, you just start talking to them about everything you've been wanting to tell them for the last six months. Because now you got a hold of them. Or you've been trying to reach somebody and finally you get a hold of him and you start giving him everything you wanted to say. So once Avram broke into the shell and the guy's belief in God started getting a little stronger, then he used the opportunity. And he started explaining to them, you know, there has to be a God. Well, maybe the God is the water. No, it can't be the water because the water is, you know, doesn't have ability to create. And then he kept on going on and on. In other words, they didn't bless God to avoid a fee. They considered Avram's argument to avoid the fee. And to thank Hashem and to give Avram's opinion consideration. And therefore, the thanks to Hashem was truthful. I'll give you an example. You know, let's say in college, there's a Jewish organization, a Chabad or Hillel or another Jewish organization that's offering students $500 to learn classes about Judaism. Now, people that have no interest, the $500 is not going to turn them on. The ones that have some interest, the $500 will get them in the door. But once they're in the door, it's not about the $500 anymore. It's more about the whole experience about learning about Judaism. Like, um, like Dr. Jonathan Snyderman told me many times that when he was in his 20s, he joined a, a free trip to Israel. And they said they're going to do touring and they're going to have a really a blast. And it was, it was uh, by an organization, I think it was Eisha Torah or something, that offered them to go to Israel. And when he arrived to Israel, they basically came to a yeshiva. He thought he's supposed to be touring and having a good time and, you know, touring the whole Israel and eating in restaurants. And then meanwhile, they put him in a yeshiva. He said, wait a minute, I didn't come to sit in yeshiva. I don't want to study now for 10 days. I want to go around Israel. 
They said, don't worry, you'll sit and learn and we'll go in the evenings. We'll go. But the bottom line was they got him to sit in yeshiva for 10 days. And he ended up having fun here and there. So was he forced into it? In a way, maybe, but the bottom line was once he was there, he had interest and he had an involvement. So Abraham didn't force them. He told them his opinion. It was more worth it for them to praise God than it would to, be, to pay the fee. But once they praised God, they started having interest in God because he broke their shell. In other words, instead of apologizing, the Rebbe basically explains like this. And this is the Rebbe's idea. You know, we don't have to apologize for Avram Avinu. And I'll tell you why. The Rebbe himself, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, realize that every Jew has something good deep inside them. And Abraham realized this with the Gentiles that were coming inside. He said, deep inside, there's something good. There's something beautiful. I just need to open it up. And when I open up what's deep inside, all of a sudden, it's going to shine. It's a whole different game. It's a whole different animal, as we say. He never gave up on anyone, the Rebbe. You see people visiting the Rebbe or people coming to dollars for the, by the Rebbe and everything. Every Jew has something good inside them. This great man once said to the Rebbe that today's youth, you can't tell them anything. You know, and this is back in the 60s. Can you imagine today? <laughs> you definitely can't tell them anything. So the, the man tells the Rebbe that today's youth, you can't tell them anything. So the Rebbe replied and said, yes, but you can inspire them to do anything. You can't tell them anything, but you can inspire them to do anything. The Rebbe was like Avram, he did not judge anyone. Every human being. He didn't see how, where they are today, he said where they could be in the future. And that's how the Rebbe would judge everybody. This is exactly how Avram saw his guests. He didn't see a shallow individual that's incapable of lofty philosophies. He saw a passionate individual which is ready to change. We just need to break that shell. He had to get into the door and all of a sudden the light came in until they started believing. Avram did not make a money trap. He gave them a love trap. Avraham wanted that they should feel that when they fight against the belief in God, it's only because they have a shell that's protecting. Once you break that shell, they're available for an enormous amount of belief in Hashem. Avram could have made any other artificial pressure, but he selected something that will put the students in a circumstance that they should be able to see what Avraham saw. Good people that are in a shell. He went to their real essence. And what he explained them is, everything has a cause. We have to look for the cause of the universe. Even if you say the universe has always been here, but there still has to be a cause. Who's the cause of that cause? And when you go back to Hashem, there is no cause to that cause. The beginning of everything is Hashem himself. 
There's many people that don't want to argue with anyone about God. They don't want to bring it up. They say that it's beyond the human reach. We don't have the tools to measure it. The logic might not explain it to everyone. Avraham gave emotions to understand it. He gave them to understand that there's a cause to everything. When he asked them, where does this food come from? He demonstrated to them that you have to consider where it comes from. You have to go to the beginning of the time. And this forced the guests to believe in Hashem. And now we'll conclude with this thought. Text number 11. Okay. We learned that Abraham Avinu did not threaten his visitors to bless them. But he used with a passion, he used Pressure, nice pressure, that they should at least listen to his side. When they heard his opinion, they were on board. The non-Jews before Mount Sinai were not inclined to godliness at all. Avram was able to create this connection and open the shell. But us Jews after Mount Sinai, we have a godly soul. If there's a crust and you're speaking to another Jew and the soul is not being inspired, you have to break the crust. When you break the crust, everything comes out. He does not have to be convinced because deep inside every Jew, there's a soul. And this answers our question. Is there any value of that Chabad rabbi that stopped you in the middle of the street and you were pressured and you put on tefillin, or you took a Shabbat candles, and you lit the candles Friday night, or you lit the Hanukkah menorah? Is there any value to it? The answer is yes. No Jew will not, every Jew that does a mitzvah, it uncovers his essence. It uncovers his soul and deep inside. When you go into that mitzvah mobile on Fifth Avenue, and you put on tefillin, and all of a sudden you get inspired. I think there was a, recently someone sent me a video of a reformed rabbi speaking at an event or something. And he said that he was, in, he was on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and a Chabad rabbi stopped him and asked him, if he, are you Jewish? And he said, yes, of course I'm Jewish. He asked him, did you put on tefillin today? And the rabbi's like, no, actually, today I forgot, I forgot to put on tefillin. <laughs> and he put on, he put on tefillin with him inside the thing. But it was interesting that the reformed rabbi was ready to get up in the in the synagogue and tell everyone that he forgot to put on tefillin that day. But the Chabad rabbi inspired him and he went and he uh, and he put on the tefillin. But you know what happens? It could happen to anyone. You forget to put on tefillin. And here you are putting on tefillin. So our conclusion for today is. Number one, when you're approached to do a mitzvah, do the mitzvah, even if it's a small mitzvah, because it'll lead you, it opens the door to many. If you have a neighbor that you want to maybe bring, bring her Shabbat candles, bring her a Hanukkah menorah, the outcome of it, it will be, you will get into their essence. And when they do a little, they will do a lot. Even by yourself, you say, you know what, maybe I don't keep Shabbat anyway, so who makes a difference if I'm going to keep a little? Yes, if you keep Shabbat for one hour and one Shabbat, you say, you know what, I'm not going to turn on the television. I'm not going to use my phone during Shabbat. I'm not going to turn on the fire. So you're going to say, oh, but I'm not keeping Shabbat anyway, so what does it make a difference? Because that makes a difference for that little time that you keep what you could. If you say, you know what, I don't really keep kosher anyway, so what does it make a difference if once I'm not going to keep kosher? So the idea basically is little leads to a lot. And we all know it in many things. You know, you start something small and from something small, it becomes something large. 
and even bigger. And you know by yourself, we all know in our personal lives, small, unfortunately, to the negative could lead to a lot of negative. But in a mitzvah, a small mitzvah could always reach to many, many beautiful mitzvot. So we learn from Avram Avinu, don't give up on anyone. Don't give up on that Jew that you think is a lost case. Don't give up on even in your own family that you think they're lost. There's no such thing. Inspire them, awaken them, and they will definitely have room for improvement thanks to your inspiration. Any questions? Shakoya Rabbi. Very good. Yeah. So I think the issue is that uh, Avraham showed his passion and his enthusiasm for what he believed in. And that's what was contagious. So when he finally had their attention and they said, oh, okay, thank God. But they wanted to know more because they were intrigued by his enthusiasm and his passion as your congregation is, is, in, is drawn in by your enthusiasm and your passion because you've carried the enthusiasm and the passion down from generation to generation, rabbi to rabbi. And that's what creates the following. So I think that's where we're going. You know, it's funny because I was in Thank you. Thank Budapest. You in Budapest, well said. walking into to a mall in Budapest and two guys, I didn't speak, I don't speak any Polish at all. Okay. And they come over and says, Hey, Lula of an S rope. Lula of an S rope. They're holding a Lula of an S rope. Lula of an S rope. Like that. I didn't. It said, No, I didn't do it. They hand me Lula of an S rope. I did the bracha and I said, Wow, I love their enthusiasm. I love their passion. <laughs> and, and it made me feel good. And it's interesting. You say, Well, what was the big deal? Well, the big deal is here I am five years later and I still remember it. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's it's funny how that, that is. So it's the enthusiasm, the passion that's contagious. Yes. Rabbi Man. Yes, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Very good. So um I think, and I might be off on this, but when you look at some like context, I think the mitzvah mobiles and the Rebbe doing that started maybe in, in earnest in 1967 um at the Six Day War. Right. And it, that was a miracle. And the thing is, with the United States, um, pre-1967, you were Jewish inside your home and you were American out on the streets. Because generally asking somebody, are you Jewish? For, for centuries, that could be anti-Semitism, you know, and people would not admit they're Jewish. So it's a very interesting phenomenon about having that line, are you Jewish? Because that would normally be something you'd run away from. Because where are the Jews? Let's round them up and everything else. And it took the Rebbe to kind of turn that around. And I think now it's it's understood what that is. But I think early on, that was a real transformation. Because, again, you were American on the outside, you know, and you're Jewish, you observe your rituals on the, on the inside. So that's one point I wanted to make. The other is about Chabad. I mean, having, um, you know, my daughter who went to you know, college and the Chabad on campus, and this almost reminds me of what you were saying about Abraham. But the way they, the Chabad gets college students to come in is <laughs> a taste a challenge. of home. It's food. It's, 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 it's a taste of home. And yeah. then they learn other things. But they wouldn't come to the Chabad house if it wasn't a great meal. Right. In fact, on a lot of college campuses, there's a hill and a Chabad, and who has the best food? But that's the way to their, you know, the way to their brain or their yeah. mind is to their stomach. And I think it's, you know, and, and everything is tied to food, which is a great way of getting people in there because it's non-threatening. Come for a meal and then stay and learn. But I think the whole thing about uh, the Mitzmobiles and are you Jewish, now it's turned into something else. But when you go back and look at it, that was revolutionary about what yeah, they did. Very true. You and, can be you know, Jewish out of the shul and out of the yeshiva. You're Jewish wherever you are. Very good. But it took that, you know, because a lot of people would run away because they don't want to like, are you Jewish? Who, you know, who are you? Are right, you right. You know, so it's a very interesting phenomenon when you think about that. Yeah, very good. Well said. Okay, well, it's great to see you all. And, um, and hope to see you soon. Hope to see you sooner. <laughs> yes, I hope to see you soon. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Take care, everybody. You know, the Rebbe tells a story about this little girl and um, 
Israel who she was in a secular family and uh, she's maybe five years old and she came home one day and said, you know, my friend lights the Shabbos candles. I want to light the Shabbos candle. And her mother was afraid it would, you know, her mother wasn't into it. And she's like, it's going to disrupt the routine. We're not going to do that now. And the little girl, like, had a tantrum. And she said, you know, why can't I do it? You know, like, my friends do it. You know, they're telling me I should do it. Like, I want to do it. And so eventually, like, after all this commotion and, like, crying episode, like, the mom gave in and the little girl was able to say the bracha and light the Shabbos candle. And, and she like, as she's lighting it, she's like walking around telling everybody that you can't move the candle, you know, while it's lit and, you know, you can't do this. And so, so they do it. And then, so the next week they let her do it again. And as the weeks go by, you know, they feel like maybe it isn't right to like answer the tele, you know, the phone's ringing, like maybe they shouldn't be answering the telephone, like while she, the candle is there, while she's lighting the candle. So they turn off the phone and the weeks go by and then they're like, you know, the TV's on while, you know, this is going on. They feel like maybe, you know, so they turn off the TV while the, you know, the, this can't, while they, she's lighting the candle. And then, and then they feel like, you know, they're just wearing like their shorts and t-shirt while this is going on. And so then, they feel like during during this whole thing, they should, you know, wear a Shabbos clothes. And so as you see, it goes on and on. And eventually, you know, they start keeping the Shabbos just based on this little girl wanting to light the Shabbos. You know? Right. Yeah. And, and, the Reb, and the whole family became kosher and everything just from right. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.